Grace and peace be with you today. It's so wonderful to see all of your faces and know that you are here. And as we are in the presence of God during this time of worship, one embodied practice that we have been doing is lighting a Christ candle. So if you have a candle nearby, great. If you don't, that's okay. But if you do, we can light it together. Be reminded that Christ is the light of the world, welcoming us to this time of worship, connecting us across the screens today, centering us into this time as we see how God is working in this place and in our lives. So let us pray together this morning. Almighty God, we thank you that you are with us. Come Holy Spirit, make your presence known to us in the scriptures, in the singing, in the silence, in the preaching, and in the praying. We thank you for the gift of the church. Continue to help us embody who you are to one another and all of those we encounter this day. Lead us into this time of worship that we may abandon all the busyness of our lives in this moment to receive your grace. In the name of your son, Jesus Christ, we pray. Amen. Amen. I just have one highlight for you this morning. Um, I just, uh, we mentioned this last week, but I want to mention it again um, in our um, Black, Black History Month. The Religion and Race Commission of our denomination here in the Conference of Virginia has cultivated a list of 29 ways you can participate in Black History Month. And you can find this on the landing page of our website. Um, and I love this message from them. It says, no matter your heritage, culture, or racial background, Black history, is everyone's story. Um, and they have cultivated this list that um, has includes books, includes arts and entertainment, but also includes um, patronizing um, black owned businesses um, and other kinds of advocacy projects. So it's a kind of a width and breadth of different kinds of ways that we can um, celebrate and participate with our black brothers and sisters um, in this month, but also beyond uh, February. Um, so it is our joy and our privilege to welcome Reverend Dr. John E. Guns today, who is the Dean of the Samuel, I always leave out some words, DeWitt Proctor School of Theology um, at Virginia Union University here in Richmond, Virginia. And also with us is Dr. Denise Jansen, who is an Associate Professor of Christian Education and Interim Assistant to the Dean, uh, also at the same school. And also Laura Davis is here, who is the Executive Assistant in the Dean's office, and she will be bringing music for us a little bit later. Um, we are so grateful to have you all here with us in worship. And with that, I invite Ms. Davis to open us uh, or to continue us in worship. Thank you again for this opportunity to just come and share this morning with you. I take it and I count it a blessing to be able to use the gift that God has given me of song. So I ask that you just pray with me, enjoy, and allow God to bless you. As I sing the first selection, blessed assurance, Jesus is mine. <clears throat> Blessed assurance, Jesus is mine. Oh, what a foretaste of glory divine, heir of salvation. Purchase of God, born of his spirit, washed in his blood. This is my story. This is my song, praising my Savior. All the day long, this is my story, this is my song, 
I'm praising my Savior all the day long. Perfect submission, perfect delight, visions of a rapture now burst on my side. Angels descending, bringing from above echoes of mercy. With his birth of love. Listen, this is my story. This is my song. I'm raising my savior day long. This is my story. Yes, this is my song. Praising my Savior all the day long. Praise God. As we move to our time of scripture, I'd invite you to pray with me these words as a prayer of illumination. Lord, open our hearts and our minds by the power of your Holy Spirit, that as the scriptures are read and your word is proclaimed, we may hear with joy what you say to us today. Our Old Testament reading today comes from Genesis chapter 45, I'll be reading verses 3 through 11 and verse 15. This is from the New Revised Standard Version of the Bible. Joseph said to his brothers, I am Joseph. Is my father still alive? But his brothers could not answer him. So dismayed were they at his presence. Then Joseph said to his brothers, come closer to me. And they came closer. He said, I am your brother, Joseph, whom you sold into Egypt. And now do not be distressed or angry with yourselves because you sold me here. For God sent me before you to preserve life. For the famine has been hard in the land these two years. And there are five more years in which there will be neither plowing nor harvest. God sent me before you to preserve you, for you a remnant on the earth and to keep alive for you many survivors. So it was not you who sent me here, but God. He has made me a father to Pharaoh and Lord of all his house and ruler over all the land of Egypt. Hurry, go up to my father and say to him, thus says your son, Joseph, God has made me Lord of all Egypt. Come down to me. Do not delay. You shall settle in the land of Goshen and you shall be near me, you and your children and your children's children, as well as your flocks and your herds and all that you have. I will provide for you there, since there are five more years of famine to come, so that you and your household and all that you have will not come to poverty. And he kissed his brothers and wept upon them. And after that, his brothers talked with him. This is a word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Our New Testament reading today comes from the Gospel of Luke, chapter, 20, uh, chapter 6, verses 27 to 38. Today I'll be reading from the New Revised Standard Version updated edition, which has just been completed and will be released earlier, uh, a little bit later this spring. Here are these words. But I say to you who are listening, love your enemies. Do good to those who hate you. Bless those who curse you. Pray for those who mistreat you. 
If anyone strikes you on the cheek, offer the other also. And anyone from anyone, <clears throat> excuse me, and from anyone who takes away your coat, do not withhold even your shirt. Give to everyone who asks of you. And if anyone takes away what is yours, do not ask for it back again. Do to others as you would have them do to you. If you love those who love you, what credit is that to you? For even sinners love those who love them. If you do good to those who do good to you, what credit is that to you? For even sinners do the same. If you lend to those from whom you expect to receive payment, what credit is that to you? Even sinners lend to sinners to receive as much again. Instead, love your enemies, do good, and lend, expecting nothing in return. Your reward will be great, and you will be children of the Most High. For God himself is kind to the ungrateful and the wicked. Be merciful, just as your Father is merciful. Do not judge, and you will not be judged. Do not condemn, and you will not be condemned. Forgive, and you will be forgiven. Give, and it will be given to you. A good measure, pressed down, shaken together, running over, will be put into your lap. For the measure you give will be the measure you get back. May we hear in these words from Holy Scripture, a word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Man, um, thank you for this incredible and amazing opportunity to share, uh, not simply in preaching, but in worship with you. Uh, I am so honored. And, uh, and, and to my new sister, Crystal, thank you. Uh, I look forward to <laughs> a long journey of us working together. Um, I want to acknowledge uh, one of my colleagues from the from Virginia Union, Dr. Ingrid Burkan Barkey. She's the dean of of, uh, of our School of of, of Latin America, uh, and so I am so honored she's here. And even my CFO from my church, I've mentioned it to my staff, and I see him on, and maybe some others. So thank you all for your time of sharing and support. Thank you, Dr. Denise, for the reading of the word of God. It leads us into our message today. Um, kind, of a, kind of a cultural joke you may or may not understand what I'm getting ready to say, but you know, uh, typically when I prepare to preach, because I've been preaching for 36 years now, I I'm not sure I've gotten any better since the first day, but um, you know, typically, you know, I, I preach a great deal so when people ask me, you know, what are you preaching? Uh, and, and they ask for the scripture, I'll tell them, you know, I'll share with you the day before. Well, you guys said, no, we need to know a week in advance. I was like, you don't understand. I, I don't even think about the sermon until, yeah, because I'm, yeah. So because of them, I worked through this message <laughs> and, uh, and, and I really, really, and I was strengthened and encouraged by the challenge. And so today um, I, I wanna talk about do good to others. That's what we'll share today. And it's from, it's from the New Testament passage that was shared. Um, verse 31, I wanna extricate verse 31. Uh, and out of the Good News Translation, it says, do for others just what you want them to do for you. Do for others just what you want them to do for you. The time is always right to do the right thing. This profound quote by Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. uttered over 50 years ago in the midst of a treacherous and tumultuous time still reigns true today. The time is always right to do the right thing. For the idea and the ideal of doing right is not constricted or constrained to certain conditions or circumstances by certain people. No, doing right is about embracing the ethic of the eternal God who through Jesus Christ 
has revealed God's self in the purest, most liberating way. Doing right is so needed today because we live in a season of great distress, a time filled with obvious pain, undeniable polarization, and a seemingly never ending pandemic. We live in a time where people are searching for answers to the questions that seem to have no healthy resolution. We live in a world at a time where good people of all races, diverse lifestyles, cultural backgrounds, and religious expressions are grappling to be heard over the noise of anger and hatred. It seems that evil shrouded in the garments of incivility and disrespect have greater influence than goodness and righteousness. Yet I firmly believe that despite the many challenges we face, there is a powerful transcendent hope that inspires us, provokes us, motivates us to do right. Yes, to do right then is not about self-interest, but it is out of a selfless model most evident in Jesus Christ, the Lamb of God who defined his mission as taking away the sins of the world and giving to all who would confess him abundant life. Today, as we gather virtually, we do so invigorated to do right. Doing right simply means serving others in a way that their lives are better. Doing right has to do with living, driven by praxis, a life where the sacred and service marries to produce undeniable acts of transformation. It's about sharing our best selves with others, knowing that our loving, merciful God is revealing God's self to us and through us in caring and redemptive ways. It's interesting that our dear sister, Sister Mary mentioned Henry Nowen, who is my favorite, is one of my favorite authors, him and Howard Thurman. And, and Henry Nowen once wrote, when we honestly ask ourselves which person in our lives means the most to us, we often find that it is those who, instead of giving advice or solutions or cures, have chosen rather to share our pain and to touch our wounds with a warm and tender hand. Today, we don't need more great ideas. We don't even need more sophisticated technology. Rather, we need those touched by God who will share themselves with others who are suffering, who are hurting, who feel isolated, who feel disenfranchised, who feel impotent, who feel overwhelmed. We need those who will offer themselves in a loving, kind, meaningful way so that others do not feel broken and frustrated and overwhelmed. We need persons who understand that faith is more than creeds and confessions, but it is the conduct that the truly in, it is the conduct that truly incarnates the Christ, our Redeemer the Christ, our Lord, the Christ, our eternal salvation, the Christ, our elder brother, the Christ, the one who came to remind us of God's agape, the one who gently reminds us in the midst of the chaos of this present time that we are valued and loved. Despite gender, orientation, race, or class, we are loved. These gentle reminders are enacted and experienced through women and men who grace with humility chooses to offer themselves to others as the instrumentality of divine service. This is wonderfully articulated through the teaching ministry of Jesus in Luke chapter six. For his earthly ministry, for, for through his earthly ministry, the master teacher defines what doing right looks like. Jesus succinctly states that doing right is about doing good to others. Yes, doing good to others. This divine directive was not new, for in the Old Testament, we hear this throughout. In the Torah, the Jews were instructed to be kind to orphans and widows. The poor were not to be neglected, but lovingly cared for. Those with means were called to live generously by sharing their resources that was the result of the ultimate source. Jesus walking out the traditions of old now reconfirms and reestablishes this by calling those who would dare to follow him to do right by doing good to others. This clear mandate of discipleship leaves no room for human interpretation. No, we can't mess this one up. Doing good is what Jesus required of all of us. 
There is no way to minimize this or misdirect this. Doing good to others is what Jesus required of all of us. Jesus, the ultimate servant, calls his followers to serve others by being the embodiment, the personification, and the manifestation of service. Service has to do with more than giving out of the reservoir of your means, but rather giving through forgiveness and mercy and compassion that which others need so that they can manage the sometime challenges of their existence. Jesus calls them then and us now to express his heart by extending his hands so that all will come to know him as their savior and Lord and experience the non-negotiable relentless love of a merciful, sovereign, transcendent, yet imminent God who refuses to give up on that, which that, on, on that which our God has created. In essence, do good to others. But how? How can flawed women and men often consumed by self-preservation and self-interest possibly do good to others? Well, here's how it's possible from my very uh, naive way. Here it is. First, we must avail ourselves in an intimate way to Jesus Christ. We must avail ourselves in an intimate way to Jesus Christ. I believe this intimacy results from a persistent prevailing prayer life. Charles Spurgeon once said, to pray is to enter the treasure house of God and to gather riches out of an inexhaustible storehouse. The ability to do good comes from a pure heart. And it is through prayer where we encounter God, thus growing in relationship with God through Jesus Christ and with others who are the expression of our God. I grew up in a very Christian home. I don't think you heard what I said. I grew up in a very Christian home. Okay, I'll say it again. I grew up in a very Christian home. If you knew my mother, you would understand. Bibles in every room, inclusive of the bathroom. She figured that the word could be read in whatever room you were in. And I grew up as a little boy watching my mother and my father pray every day. My father, who will be 95 in next Friday, often says to me now, son, I am praying for you. I have come to understand the power of prayer as not some perfunctory religious activity that we do to check the boxes of a relationship that is stagnant and stayed. No, prayer is a part of this organic, um, uh, 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 organic relationship that is constantly growing, constantly getting better because we are vulnerable. Yes, the key word, we are vulnerable to God, which makes us capable of being vulnerable in service to others. Jesus taught us this by modeling the consistency needed to pray and the content needed in prayer. Prayer is vital because it shapes us like nothing else can. The relentless pursuit of God through prayer ensures that our hearts are always open to God who is always available to us. We can only purposefully serve others when we passionately seek God in prayer. This means, watch this, solitude must be embedded into the routine of our lives. I almost got angry, Sister Mary, because you were preaching before I got here. Henry Nowen once wrote, again, one of my favorite authors, to live a spiritual life, we must first find the courage to enter into the desert of our loneliness and to change it by gentle and persistent efforts into the garden of solitude. The movement from loneliness to solitude, however, is the beginning of any spiritual life because it is the movement from the restless senses to the restful spirit. I, from outward reaching, I from outward reaching cravings to inward reaching search from fearful clinging to fearless play. Well, here's the second thing that's necessary for us to do good to others is that we must have a strong moral compass that calls us to redemptive behavior. I find this interesting, Crystal, that Jesus would use us to define how we should treat others. Okay, watch the irony. A flawed, inadequate person who needs help is told to use your own value, 
your own convictions to guide you in how you serve others. This means that if you do not have a strong moral compass, then the way you treat others will be guided by a distorted sense of self. In essence, the foundation of our faithfulness exists because my moral center is centered in Christ. What is a moral compass? The moral, uh, it, it is simply defined as, as, as an internalized set of values and objectives that guides a person with regard to ethical behavior and decision-making. Wow, that means that the way I see others is determined by the values and convictions that shape me. This means that this amazing process of inner peace, inner rest, inner hope, and inner salvation is a part of helping me engage others. Uh, if you saw me in, in person, you would notice that I'm five, two and a half, and I'm 200 and none of your business. So you would immediately assume I'm not much of an athlete. Uh, you should have met me 40 years ago. I would have surprised you. But today you're right. I'm not much of an athlete. But I do try to play a little golf. Not very good at it. I tell my friends all the time, Paul Flowers, that if golf was a diet, I would lose weight quicker. Interestingly enough, golf is interesting because golf is the test of integrity. See, I don't play in front of thousands of people like Tiger once did. No, it's normally just my friends and I. And if I happen, which I do pretty often, Denise hit a ball in the woods and I go searching for the ball. It's interesting when I first started that a ball would be found, but it was oftentimes in my pocket. It would, it would fall out of my pocket and I would holler to my playing buddies, hey, found my ball. Then one day, one of my friends said, John, you do know that that's an integrity issue. And I became slightly offended, but I understood his point. What I learned was that integrity is not what you do when people are watching. It's what you do when you think no one is watching. It's doing right because your moral compass makes you consistent in behavior. You cannot do good to others if your moral compass directs you towards selfishness and self-centeredness. Masha Fudd once said, a nation cannot be truly great without a moral compass. Well, I close with this final point, that we can do good to others when our desire drives us to act kindly. Being a true disciple is not memorizing the Bible, but modeling Christ. It's about more than knowing the word. It's rather, it's about being the word. This begins with your desire, your desire to be like Jesus Christ. You must crave to do good for others like a thirsty person longs for a cup of water on a hot summer day. But none of this is possible without love. Jesus in John 15 summarizes this when he says, my commandment is this, love one another just as I love you. The greatest love you can have for your friends is that you give your life for them. And you are my friends if you do what I command. So I conclude by challenging you to do right by doing good, to be kind and merciful, to be a person that is available to help others be their best, to give of yourself. And if you do, as my mother reminded me on her way to glory, that there are two precious words that will, that will ring in your soul and your spirit. And they are the words that every believer seeks to hear from God. Well done. I challenge you to do good for in doing good, you will hear well done. Let us, let us pray. O eternal and liberating God, we thank you for the ability, the capacity, the passion, the, the desire, the yearning, the longing to do good. We understand that Jesus Christ, your son, the one you sent to redeem us is our model and our example for doing good. So we choose on this day to live a life that honors you and life that pleases you by doing good. And we pray this prayer, the prayer 
that your son taught us to pray. Our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. A kingdom come that will be done in earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. Forgive us our trespasses as we forgive them who trespass against us and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory forever and ever. Let us all say together, amen. I have the opportunity to offer just a word of, uh, of a mission moment, um, introducing you or reintroducing you to the School of Theology at Virginia Union and to the work that we share with the Virginia Annual Conference and with all of the, all of the brothers and sisters who are here. The School of Theology at Virginia Union is, is uh, not a new thing. We've been around for 156 years, uh, founded in Lumpkins Jail. Um, down down near the, the river, down near I-95. And we have, uh, for, for all of that time, sought to equip women and men for um, ministries of all sorts. Um, preaching ministry being an obvious one among them and certainly a priority for us, but also um, other sorts of ministries. We primarily prepare men and women for ministries in, in the local church and primarily in African-American congregations. That's our heritage. Uh, but we have for a couple of decades now been uh, privileged also to prepare women and men for ministry in the United Methodist Church. We're endorsed by the United Methodist uh, University Senate and have the, have the privilege of journeying with uh, not, not a small number of uh, Virginia Annual Conference pastors um, who have come through come through our doors. Um, as we welcome into our midst United Methodists, we are enriched by the heritage um, that United Methodism brings by its rich theology and, and also have the opportunity to learn together what it is to be brothers and sisters in Christ. School of Theology is uh, roughly 400 students. Um, am I inflating that, Dean? <laughs> Just a little bit, maybe. <laughs> That's a hopeful number. I think we're more like 380, but we're close. <laughs> um, the, the programs we offer are Master of Divinity, Master of Arts in Christian Education, uh, Doctor of Ministry. We'll be adding a track for chaplaincy in our MDiv in the fall. We'll also be adding a PhD within the next year. So do, uh, do continue to to be look, looking for people who are, who are discerning their call in ministry and who are uh, discerning that those, one of those degrees might be a part of that call. Sometimes we're asked, how can people help us? One of those ways, obviously, is to pray. Um, we, we do a work every day that is um, complex and um, filled with opportunities for for uh, struggle and, and difficulty and for students, to, for students to get off track. And we appreciate your prayers every day that we um, will continue to be faithful to the mission God has given us. Um, another way that you can help uh, the School of Theology, if you are so led, is to invite um, gifted and called and capable students to consider the School of Theology of Virginia Union as one of the paths they might take to ministry. Um, the, the path that one might take often influences the rest of one's ministry. And I can tell you that a student who comes to Virginia Union will be forever changed by it. One of my colleagues says, uh, don't, don't, let, don't, let, uh, don't run through seminary, let the seminary run through you. Let this experience um, ruminate in your heart. And, and that's been our experience. A uh, third way, obviously, is to support the School of Theology, um, giving in a variety of ways, and we can certainly help you with that. And finally, get to know the School of Theology. We are, we are a school that serves United Methodist students right here in the midst. And I think for, um, for, for some Virginia United Methodists, there is some um, mystery about that. Uh, you are welcome always to join us for uh, chapel on Saturdays and Thursdays. Um, there's information about that on our website. And thank you, Crystal, for posting that for me. 
Um, there's also um, all sorts of opportunities to connect with Virginia Union with the School of Theology. We invite you to be a part of who we are and to just to get to know uh, the School of Theology and to be in, in community with us. Thank you for the opportunity to be with you today. Thank you so much, Denise. I want to invite Laura to come and to close us in worship today. Um, Laura, as you are able. Great is thy faithfulness, O oh God, my Father. There is no shadow of turning with thee. Thou changest not the compassion. They fail not as thou hast been, thou forever will be. Great is thy faithfulness, great is thy faithfulness, morning by morning. No mercy is I see. All I have needed, the hand has provided. Great is thy faithfulness, Lord, to me. Summer and winter. And springtime and harvest, sun, moon, and stars in their courses above. Join with all nature and man, witness to thy great faithfulness, mercy, and love. Great is thy faithfulness. Great is thy faithfulness. Morning by morning, no mercies I see. All I have needed, thy hand has provided. Great is thy faithfulness, Lord, unto me. Pardon for sin and peace that endureth. Thine own dear presence to cheer and to guide. Strength for today. And I hope for tomorrow. Blessings of mine with ten thousand beside. Great is thy faithfulness. Yes. Great is thy faithfulness. Morning by morning. No mercy, I see. All I have needed, thine hand has provided. Mm. Great is thy faithfulness. Great is thy faithfulness. Yes, great is thy faithfulness. Great is thy faithfulness, Lord, unto me. Yes.
Yes, indeed. Uh, siblings in Christ, if you're with me, say amen uh, in the chat or in the, in the quiet of your room, but say amen. Um, so grateful for all of you who have been here with us today. I wanted to invite you back next Wednesday when Adam Souter will be our preacher. Um, he is the lead pastor at Discovery United Methodist Church, and we look forward to having him with us. Um, Dr. Jansen, Dr. Guns, Ms. Davis, thank you so, so much. Um, for leading us today in worship. Um, your words have been inspired. We are enriched um, as a community and so grateful uh, for our partnership in ministry um, as we lead people into all kinds of service uh, for the kingdom and the kingdom. I want to invite Dr. Guns to give us now the benediction. Now, now unto the God who's able to keep us all to the God whose love is evident in every expression, even in the challenging ones, that love which reminds us that we are valued, and that we matter. May that God keep you, strengthen you, encourage you. In the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, let us all say together, amen. Amen. God bless. God